uh, she's on uh, anything single photon. So if you have any single photon questions, that's the person. I've lost several bets to her. Uh, so don't make any bets with Elizabeth on, on physics questions, but do uh, use her wisdom and insights. Yeah. Over to you. Thanks, Kenner. Um, all right. I'm really happy to be here. Let me get rid of Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's always fun to visit. And thank you for the weather this time. Last year, when you convinced me to come to Arizona, <laughs> I got snowed on in February and it was beautiful in Illinois. But right. I, I, yes, but this I appreciate. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the research going on in my group. I'm an experimentalist, to be clear, very much an experimentalist, to be clear. Um, and please, please, please interrupt with questions. Happy to, to answer questions along the way. Don't feel the need to save them till the end. So, uh, my group, we focus on quantum memory, quantum light matter interfaces. So, basically, building connections between light and atoms or things that, if you squint until your head, look like atoms uh, that are sufficient for quantum networking and other quantum interactions. Um, and we focus mostly on rare earth atoms and solids as our atoms. Um, and I'm going to talk about that bit. So, you guys are all quantum people, but some of you are theorists and some of you do other quantum things. Um, and so it is helpful for me to explain what I mean when I say quantum networks, um, I feel like at the beginning of a talk like this, even for an expert audience. So what do I mean when I call something a quantum network? Well, I mean that there's some light matter interface, right? That's kind of the base unit of the, of the quantum network. I'm mostly, I'm talking about single photons here. Obviously, most of what I say could be ported over to some continuous variable scheme, but we're gonna stick with single photons. I mean, I'm not even really gonna talk much about it, but when I think about quantum networks, I usually think about single photons. These kind of nodes at the, at the, um, in the quantum network, they could either be kind of a few qubits or a whole quantum computer or anything in between. And the whole goal of a quantum network or the whole function kind of of a quantum network is generating entanglement across some distance with some optical channel, some quantum optical channel. Right. And what is this kind of a thing useful for? Well, I don't know, the things that we tell the government that it's useful for, right? The things that we think it's useful for, whatever that is. Okay. Great. So why don't we have quantum networks everywhere? Right? Why is it hard to build quantum networks? So it's non-trivial to make single photons or entangled pairs of photons or continuous variable states of light. It is non-trivial to make states of light that are suitable for distributing entanglement. A laser is not suitable, and all of the things that are, you have to figure out how to find. Optical losses, right? They're really right at the top of the list. They're the big one. So light gets lost. I can't send it more than about 15 kilometers or store it for more than some tens of microseconds. Um, before I'm going to lose it. And that's kind of the absolute best that I could possibly do, sending telecom band light down an optical fiber with no other losses in my system, right? As a general rule, my losses are much worse than that. My storage times are much worse than that. And if I'm on a photonic chip, like, you know, everybody wants to put everything on a chip these days for all sorts of good reasons, including me, um, my losses are crazy high, right? If, if, if you have, I don't know if any of you guys work on any photonics, integrated photonics here, um, but for instance, the kind of 3 dB point, the point where you're 50% likelihood to lose light on the best uh, integrated photonic uh, waveguides um, for kind of quantum applications is something like a nanosecond or a few nanoseconds, right? That's like the kind of best you can do. Um, and then getting on and off chips or in and out of fibers, all of these things are lost as well. Okay. The other problem is that we need these matter things. I mean, right, so sure, there are all optical ways as well, right? But the reason that the all optical methods are hard um, and that usually most of the methods we talk about in the atoms is because there is no native interaction between light and light. I have no good way to take two photons and entangle them. I have some bad ways, right? I can do, you know, projective measurements that do some kind of entanglement, but they tend to be, you know, very probabilistic and a lot, it suffers from a lot of losses and the resource overhead is very high. Um, 
So I somehow need to figure out a way to to enact a light light effective light light interaction, right? In order to establish this kind of intent. And if I'm going to use stuff atoms to affect that, to mediate that light light interaction, I've got a problem that light matter interfaces are are, are weak, right? That's just a statement of the fine structure constant is small, right? If I have one atom and one photon, I send one photon at one atom, nothing happens, right? The vast majority of the time, there's a size mismatch, right? My photon is a hell of a lot bigger than, um, and so I need some way to increase these interactions if I really want to do some kind of good entanglement. Okay, so this is why we don't have quantum networks here. One of the many, some of the many reasons that we don't have quantum networks here. And so I'm gonna to focus today on, on using things that act like atoms. So atom-like emitters or quantum emitters. Um, and, and why are quantum emitters helpful for building, building quantum networks? So they're good for storage. Um, oops. They're good for storage. Um, so if I have like an ensemble of atoms or quantum emitters, um, they can coherently store a single photon or another quantum state of light uh, for some amount of time. If I can get that storage to be kind of, you know, milliseconds, that's great. That's longer than I can store in any other way. Um, for long distance kinds of things. It lets me store for round trip times in my quantum network. If I can get that storage, even at the microsecond scale, but on a chip, that's super useful. Because like I said, on a typical photonic chip, the kinds of delays that I can make with my photons are of order a nanosecond. That's not even enough time for me to really do like a little bit of electronics or logic. Or anything like that. If, I can, if I can delay a photon for some hundreds of nanoseconds, it gives me a lot more flexibility in my uh, on-chip devices. So we can also use single spins or single emitters um, to just make an entangled pair where one is a matter qubit and one is a photon. And this is another way to build up a quantum network. I have this problem that the light atom interaction is weak. And so usually I need maybe to put a cavity around it or you know, some other spins or something like that to add functionality, just one spin and one photon. My odds of collecting that photon are pretty poor if I haven't done anything else fancy to this thing, which is hard. And then, you know, the list gets really long, right? What are the other things that I can do with atom like emitters? This, there's a long, long list of, of, of things that I can do, but my focus today is going to be on, on quantum emitter. So why do I say atom like emitters and not atoms? So there are, you know, a few cold atom people here at Arizona. I was briefly a cold atom person in my postdoc. Um, cold atoms are great. You know, real atoms, what we call real atoms are great. An atom trapped in vacuum, perfect little, quantum system, little spin, little quantum emitter. Um, but for quantum optics, it's not great, right? Because it lives in vacuum and it's hard to get the photon out of an atom that lives in vacuum efficiently because you want to get something near it to get the photon out. And if you get something near it, it's not in vacuum anymore, right? Um, so emitters in solid state have a lot of benefits and it's mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. Oh, that color is not great on this projector. Um, so this direct coupling to photonic structures is one of the really top line, why do we want emitters that live in solids, right? I want to fabricate structures around, or at least be able to fabricate structures. Um, I can also make much more compact devices. I can pack them in. We're going to talk about actually some of the most, uh, the, the highest density of atom-like emitters that I think anyone has anywhere later in this talk. Um, and there's this sense of kind of, you know, manufacturability, engineerability in terms of making this. But we have to deal with the, the downsides of the fact that we don't have real atoms, right? Rubidium and vacuum would be lovely, uh, but can't always use it, right? And so my atoms that we're going to talk about today, they're not all identical, right? There's atom to atom variation. And they live in stuff where all sorts of things can happen that can cause extra decoherence, extra dephasing. There are phonons. There are other spins. There are other charges. All sorts of nonsense can happen that doesn't happen in vacuum. OK. So most of the applications that we're going to be working toward today and talking about today are, are quantum memory. So storing photons in ensembles of emitters. Um, this is, there are lots of different definitions of quantum memory, but for today, what we're thinking about is ensemble-based quantum memory. So I have lots and lots and lots of atoms. That gets me around the problem of light atom interaction is weak, right? One photon will almost certainly interact as long as I have enough atoms. Um, and I can then store that photon as some collective excitation of all the atoms in a way that I can get it back out later. Um, there are a gazillion different protocols um, for, for, for doing this. 
Um, and the primary metrics that we're interested in when we're storing photons in general are how long can I store it for, how efficiently can I store it, and how broadband of a photon can I store. That third one is particularly important because atoms themselves tend to be very, very narrow band. And so naturally, they don't want to store broadband photons. But if you want to actually do anything, you know, <laughs> narrow band is, an enemy, is your enemy. You want to do things broadband so that, you know, you graduate someday. And so uh, having your quantum memory be more broadband is very important. So two overarching concepts of how to do quantum memory, the two kind of classes of protocols is using a lambda type scheme, where I have two low lying states with some very long coherence time between them. I use some optical control field along with the single photon that comes in to generate a collective excitation on this low lying long lived transition here. Um, in general, this can have a very long storage time because the coherence times on these low lying transitions can be very, very long. Um, the bandwidth is fundamentally limited by this, but sometimes there are further limits when you have to do this, what we're going to talk about in a minute. When you um, say collective excitation, yes. to understand that's yes. a spin wave, right? Like a spin wave, exactly, right. Like one atom gets moved over here, but I don't know which one, and so I have a superposition of all of them, and so it's a collective state of all of them with a well-defined momentum, which yeah. is important because then when I come in to try and get the photon back out, the well-defined momentum of the collective state is important for getting the photon out in a well-defined direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, you know, there are other practical things that are a little challenging about this. Like, I have a single photon here, but many, many photons here, and I got to keep them separate, um, stuff like that. Right? The other kind of class of protocols are things that look kind of like photon echo, where I only have two levels. Um, what I've drawn here is the atomic frequency comb protocol, which we will not have time to get to at the end. But if somehow we magically do, I'll talk about it at the end. Um, where I'm say gonna kind of prepare my ensemble in such a way that the photon gets absorbed into a collective state of the atoms in a way that it will come out rephased and in a well-defined direction at a later time. Um, now my storage time is tends to be short because it's just the coherence time of this optical transition, which is often very short, but this is very simple to implement as a general rule, can often be very broad band. Um, I can kind of combine these two and get maybe try and get the benefits of both, but maybe also get the drawbacks of both. So. Okay, great. So in order to implement these things, what's, what do we actually want out of our, our system, out of Just our physical system? One, yes. What role does the uh, bandwidth of the lower level play? Here? Yeah. So this bandwidth is a fundamental limit to the bandwidth of the memory. You certainly can't store a photon broader band than the I splitting between these two levels. Yeah. yeah. And then there are often other limits as well, other practical limits. And what yeah. is that limit in practice? Oh, uh, it depends entirely on what your atom is. So if you use... Or Rydberg, typical Rydberg atom. When you say Rydberg, what do you actually mean? I, uh... So Rydberg, the Rydberg atom would have a level up here and wouldn't have two low-line ones here, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So what's that separation like for the typical... So in rubidium, this is 6.8 gigahertz. Okay, okay. In europium, okay. this is 50 megahertz. Okay. In neutral barium, this is hundreds of terahertz. Okay. So it really just depends on, on, right. the, on the atom that you're using. And if you want to go broader band, you gotta find something. Different. Yeah. So say hundreds of terahertz, what's the problem? I mean, uh, the photons that we deal with in optical funds are well below that. Oh yeah, so neutral barium, uh, so hot neutral barium um, has been, I believe that that experiment, which is at the University of Illinois and Gene Lorenz's group, um, I think they have shown the, the broadest band quantum memory that anyone has shown anywhere, right? But the storage time is like picoseconds, <laughs> but the efficiency is high and the bandwidth is high, right? So it's quantum, all quantum memories are bad. Anyone today basically who has a quantum memory, it, I said there are like three primary metrics. Some people, the best quantum memories in the world do okay in two of them and bad in the third. Hmm. Right. Uh, or so maybe can... good in one, okay in another one, and then bad in the third. Every quantum memory, every practical quantum memory today has massive challenges in getting to, to be really practically useful. Is there a fundamental relation? Like, how, how can I see that a, a broadband memory will have a short lived picosecond lifetime, for example? <sighs> Not super fundamental. Okay. Um, there is a bit of a fundamental relationship between bandwidth and efficiency, although uh -huh. the barrier of memory gets around that somehow. Uh -huh. Because in a sense, if you to make a really broadband memory, you need absorption over a really broad band, which feels like you need to be kind of spreading your atoms out. 
Yeah. And if you're kind of spreading them out, you should be kind of dropping the efficient, the, the absorption per bandwidth, which should drop your overall efficiency. Okay. Right? And so in fact, this hot, and now I'm talking about the hot variant memory. So the hot variant memory, which is very cool. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> They have beaten this efficiency bandwidth product that basically every other one of memory is limited to, right? They have much higher efficiencies than anyone else who can do very broadband quantum memory. But then what limits the lifetime? The atoms are really, really hot. Okay. So they're moving really, really fast. Okay. And they're bumping into each other. Did you not cool them? Well, but then you can't, it wouldn't be broadband. Okay. The bandwidth okay. comes from the fact that they're hot. Right. Okay. But that also, limits the, the memory okay. So most of the trade-offs in quantum memory are practical, right? So this is why 20 years ago, people were really bullish on quantum memory, right? I don't know who remembers 20 years ago, but like, the you know, 20 years ago, people were like, oh, quantum repeaters, quantum memories, we're gonna build these things. Quantum computers, that sounds hard. That'll be longer term. But this kind of stuff, this quantum communication stuff, quantum repeaters, we can do this now. Quantum memory, there's no fundamental limit to doing this. Let's just do it. And here we are 20 years later. There are kind of kind of quantum computers in the world. And quantum memories are only a little bit better than they were 20 years ago. Um, it's, it turns out these practical challenges in quantum memory are just insanely hard to overcome. They're not that fundamental, though. Mm -hmm. But they're universal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, I was just wondering if the bandwidth is somehow related to like through some kind of weird Heisenberg uncertainty. Yeah. To, to what? To its coherence time, but... It, no, it, so, uh, no, in fact, that that we can get around pretty easily. Um, <laughs> in both schemes, we get around that no problem. Um, it's practical limits that really, really limit us. Um, yeah. So is it, it for the hot barium, is it that you get the large bandwidth due to the heating effects or like... Yeah, so, okay, so <laughs> I can ex I'm happy to explain the hot barium memory, yeah. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, so basically what they do is they just pack a ton of barium into a heat pipe and they heat it really hot. And so it's in fact, if anyone's familiar with, with atomic gases, it's not Doppler broadened, it's collisionally broadened. The broadening that dominates is collisional broadening, um, which is homogeneous, not inhomogeneous. So Doppler broadening is inhomogeneous. It means each atom is moving at a different speed and it has a different but the collisional broadening is homogeneous. Every atom gets broadened. And it's that broadening that gives them the bandwidth increase, that collisional broadening. But you got to heat the hell out of this stuff to get to that collisionally broadened regime, um, which I think is basically what limits the lifetime. Yeah. So, so anybody actually do a study on that? These trade-offs? Uh, so I will point you to a review that recently came out that I didn't put a citation in here that we wrote that's in uh, Advances in Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics, which is specifically on large bandwidth uh, ensemble-based quantum memories, where we kind of, we do a bit of a lit review um, and talk about what's been done and what the, what the trade-offs are. Um, there's also lots of kind of narrow bandwidth approaches, right? So people have shown storage in a quantum memory compatible protocol, that is to say they didn't actually store a single photon, but because the efficiency was so low, but the protocol is such that it shouldn't add excess noise. There's no fundamental reason why it wouldn't add excess, why it would add excess noise um, for an hour, right? But very narrow bandwidth and very low efficiency, right? Um, so, and all these trade-offs, again, they're really, they're really just all practical. They're not fundamental, but they're so hard to get around. So I can, I can point you, yeah, I'm, I'd be happy to chat more, right? I mean, I can point you to the best quantum memory in each different metric, and you'll see that it's terrible in every other metric. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, so I'm an engineer. I yeah. all these stupid questions about uh, trade-offs and what you have, that's what I care about. Yeah. So I'll tell you, in, by a lot of metrics, the world's best quantum memory is also at the University of Illinois, and it is that Paul Quia has two mirrors, and he puts them like this, and they had there these Harriet's, it's a Harriet cell, so they're designed so the light bounces back and forth between the two mirrors, I think 300 times. And he can delay an optical pulse of any bandwidth, basically, he wants, because he can make very broadband mirrors, uh, with no dispersion, because it's in free space, uh, for about 12 microseconds. Right? That's about with, with I think, 
40-ish percent efficiency, something along those lines, right? Why does he get a portal index? Hmm? Why does he get a portal index? Uh, it's not a cavity. There's a little tiny hole in one mirror. Yeah, then there's a little tiny hole in the other one, and it bounces back and forth. On, they're designed very precisely, so it's called a Harriet cell. They're designed very precisely to make this crazy pattern um, of bounces that like it, it like walks around in a circle, if I remember correctly, as it bounces back and forth, and then it comes out. Um, and by many metrics, that's the world's best quantum memory. It would also it is also, I would argue, the world's dumbest quantum memory, right? <laughs> um, but it works, right? It must be pretty big. It's, it's very big. This is absolutely not something you would want to put into any system, right? I mean, tw 12 microseconds for the speed of light is what, a foot per nanosecond? So yeah, the light is traveling 12,000 feet. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, right? Um, it's just, it's so hard to store light. Um, yeah, yep. I'm sorry, I like this topic a lot, so I'm happy to chat about it more. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interject. No, no problem, yeah. Yes, thanks, very interesting. So I think with these echo type memories, typically you cannot control how long you store your photon, but it just comes out when it's sort of there's this rephasing going so on. So you control it in advance. You yeah. prepare this comb structure, and the, the details of the comb structure that you prepare and control set the memory time, right? So you prepare in advance. What you can't do in general, unless you add extra steps, is say, oh, I want the photon back out now. Exactly. In practice, every experiment you actually run, you are going to preset your memory anyway. Right? Even if it's an on-demand retrieval memory, given the current state of electronics and the current types of experiments you're doing, usually you're presetting that retrieval time anyway, you're coding it into your system. I don't see this as a huge drawback. I'm saying it's quantum repeater where everything is very random. You want to be able to get something out on the map. Right? Yes, but, 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 but yes, yes and no, right? If you want to store for a really long amount of time though, you're not going to, want it out on demand in the whole 10 milliseconds you're storing for, or 100 milliseconds you're storing for. You might want some wiggle room at the end, right? You're operating at a gigahertz. And so let's say you, you're going to store it for 100 milliseconds, but the last 100 nanoseconds, you're not sure when you want it out, right? You just add a little free space delay or fiber delay after this that's tunable, yes. right? I don't see that for me. I know that people say that that's a drawback, yeah, but for me, it's easy, not. But, uh, in <laughs> practice, that doesn't feel like a drawback. So is it the same for the lambda type memory, or? No, these are on-demand retrieval, right? Because you come back in, basically your control field reads the photon in, and then your control field reads the photon. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, it was great. We're not gonna get anywhere near the end of the talk, which is totally <laughs> fine. Uh, so, okay, what do I want out of my quantum emitters for doing these various things? I want them to act as much like atoms as I can get them to act like atoms. Right? given that they live in stuff. And so here's the one that I care about and here's the bad ones, right? the other things that are nearby. So I kind of don't want them coupling to all the other spins and charges nearby. I, I want them highly radiated. Right? So I want the light to come back out. I don't want it to come out as other energy like phonons or anything like that. Preferably, I don't want to have to buy a dilution refrigerator. That said, I'm buying a dilution refrigerator. But like preferably, I would like to at least operate at one to four Kelvin. I cannot operate at room temperature. Anyone who tells you that they have a single photon source suitable for quantum networking based on a solid state system that operates at room temperature is wrong. I will, I, I will, <laughs> they are wrong. And that is because of phonons. At room temperature, the optical phonons in the system mean that the photon that comes out is going all over the place. It's, it's, and it's broadened. It's not transform limited. You can't get transform limited out of a room temperature quantum. If you're doing quantum sensing, you seem like you've heard this before, so I'm going to go through my whole spiel. Um, if you're doing quantum sensing, like with NV centers, right, that works at room temperature because you're using the light as just the readout of the spin. Those photons are not suitable for quantum networking. I can't take two NV centers and entangle them by having them spit out photons that I interfere if the NV centers are at room temperature. They have to be cryogenic. You cannot do this at room temperature <laughs> for solid state emitters because of photons. The number of papers I've read where the introduction is, I've done, we have room temperature single photon source suitable for. Okay, sorry, that's the end of my end of my rant. Um, you would also like to be able to do nanofabrication to increase that light matter interaction by making light confining structures in your system. Uh, ideally, you want to have a spin qubit too, so you at least have the option of doing the lambda type memory or storing in some very very long lived spin qubit. And you know you want other stuff too. 
right? There's a long, long list of things that you might want. If you've got other spins or interaction or, or in there that you can interact with, you can do gates and stuff like that. If you can control the placement, that's helpful. Um, if it works in the telecom band, so 1.5 microns and around there, that's also helpful for setting it over longer distances, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of options for this. Um, my favorite uh, is rare earth atoms and solids. These are the rare earths. <clears throat> um, they are in a lot of ways the most atom-like um, of all of the different emitters that you can imagine that live inside of solids. And this is because of chemistry. So if you plot the radial wave functions of the different orbitals in the lanthanides as a function of distance from the nucleus, the 4F is the partially full shell where all the action is happening. That's where the electrons are whose state you're actually addressing. The 5S and the 5P are full, closed, and not doing anything. And you can see that the 4F lives inside the 5S, which means that when you take this thing and you put it inside of a solid, it's basically kind of in a Faraday cage. And the effect of the environment on the electrons that you're interested in is much smaller than for any other kind of a thing that you could put in a solid. You get this shielding. Yep. But doesn't that also affect optical coupling to that? Ah, that doesn't affect optical coupling to the energy levels, but what does affect optical coupling to the energy levels is somebody should be sitting here telling me that selection rules don't let me drive transitions between different 4F configurations, right? That's not allowed by selection rules. I can't drive an electric dipole, right? Yeah. I can't drive an electric, electric dipole transition between two configurations of 4F electrons. I would say you are right, but they're... The, when you go into a solid, you break symmetry, especially if it's a highly non-symmetric site, which means that you get a little tiny bit of admixing. Your, your spherical harmonics are no longer your you know, perfect wave functions. And so, in fact, what you do get in practice are weakly electric dipole allowed transitions between spin orbits split levels that are still mostly 4F in character. So you do have the problem that your light atom coupling is extremely weak, your, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, but the shielding is really a huge benefit. Yeah. Yep. So basically what we get are these highly radiative transitions um, and reasonably inhomogeneous. So the, the atom to atom shift in energy is relatively small on an absolute scale. The, the energy comes back out in light. It couples only weakly to phonons and other things in the lattice. Um, I can put them really close together, which is going to become important in a few minutes in the talk. And they don't even really see each other. How much is the inhomogeneous problem? Okay. We're going to talk about that in a second. Is that okay? okay yeah. yeah. Um, also, I can kind of post them in anything I want because, like, the post doesn't matter, right? It's kind of just a weak perturbation on what's going on in there. And then the real reason is I get crazy long coherence times. So, spin coherence of six hours has been demonstrated in these systems. I can get optical coherence times of several milliseconds in these systems. So, for quantum memory, that's really, really, really good. Why doesn't everyone work on rare earth atoms and solids? Oh, sorry, first, these things are good. They're good for all the things that I wanted that I said I wanted on the last slide. Why doesn't everyone work with rare earth atoms and solids? Well, there are also a bunch of drawbacks. And one is that this weakly allowed transition gives me these, these only kilohertz line widths, right? So each atom is very weakly coupled to light. Also, I got just a ton of levels in here because I got a ton of electrons in there. So I got a ton of states. Um, it's not a rubidium. I don't just have one electron. And so I get lots of radiated, everything's radiated or mostly radiated, but the radiative decay is everywhere. It's just in lots and lots of different um, transitions. And then also the inhomogeneous broadening. So I said it was small on an absolute scale and on an absolute scale, it is small. Unlike say NV centers where each one just looks different, right? Ours are all packed to within say a gigahertz or so. Um, but a gigahertz is big compared to the homogeneous line width of a kilohertz. And for the really, really long-lived nuclear hyperfine states in europium, which that's the ones with the six-hour coherence time, those splittings are, say, tens of megahertz. And so my even still small inhomogeneous broadening washes them out. Right. So I have to do something to, make, to, to overcome these limitations. So I can either, for the weak emission, I can use lots and lots of atoms, which is convenient because I can pack them in. Um, or I can couple to waveguides and resonance inhibitors, which is natural because I'm living in the solid state. Um, and then for this, basically the inability to resolve the really long-lived spin states over the inhomogeneity means I either have to 
use what's called spectral hole burning to select out just some very tiny sub ensemble of atoms in some very narrow spectral region so that I can resolve the spin states. But that kills my optical depth, it kills the number of atoms in my ensemble. Or I can use all the atoms in my ensemble in the full bandwidth, but I'm limited to storing on that, that optical transition with its at best millisecond, t millisecond. Okay. All right. So, two approaches that we're taking in my group um, to overcome this, now that I'm more than halfway through the talk, uh, are we're, we're identifying, synthesizing, and characterizing new materials to try and overcome, to reduce that optical inhomogeneity and try and overcome some of these uh, uh, trade offs. And then we're also investigating host materials that are good for photonic integration. Okay, so reducing the optical inhomogeneity, so this difference that each atom has in its, its optical energy. The difference, this optical inhomogeneity, is due to slightly different electric fields that live at each atom, which is hypothesized to be due to dominated by point defects in the lattice. What's the biggest point defect in a rare earth doped crystal? Well, it's the rare earth doping, right? Um, and so in a traditional rare earth doped crystal, um, you have these randomly placed rare earth atoms that are substituting for something, um, and the microscopic arrangement of them is different for each one. Each one sees a different microscopic arrangement of all the others, and that changes the field slightly, and then I get this inhomogeneous product uh, in the system. If I build a, if I grow build, if I grow a stoichiometric crystal where the I don't have any doping, my rare earth atom lives in every site, right, or every site that it should live in. Uh, I get rid of at least that source of inhomogeneity, right? And this, this principle has been shown that you can reduce the optical inhomogeneity by going to some stoichiometric material, um, though it's only been shown in materials that aren't really well suited to a lot of things. Um, and also, you have to kind of keep the atoms apart by more than you normally would in a normal crystal so that they will interact eventually if you get them too close together. So for instance, yttrium orthosilicate, which is a very common host for rare earth atoms. If I were to grow EU2SiO5 instead of europium doped Y2SiO5, the europiums would be too close together. They would no longer act. So we work with a real material scientist. Yeah. What role do phonons play in terms of the broadening? So there's, so uh, we just cool them. Okay. Right. So that's why we work at, at four Kelvin, one Kelvin, um, is to cool out all the optical phonons. So we don't have phonons. So we we work with a real material scientist. Yeah. So uh, going from your just doped crystals to your spectrometric crystals, is there anything that you can do with respect to, with respect to changing the phonon density of states? So that uh -huh. It's a really good question. In fact, there's a series of papers from this group on these kinds of materials here, where uh, for for making the individual atom line widths narrower, more radiated. They deuterate the water, for instance, because that what that does is that changes the phonon spectrum, right? So yes, but unless you're really floppy, just cooling is fine. Um, right, so we did a broad search of things that were in the literature and things that were almost in the literature, like there was like a terbium crystal in the literature, so we thought we could grow a europium crystal. Um, and did DFT on some things, and we started identifying materials that had the properties that we wanted. Basically, the nearest neighbor European spacing was kind of big on a solid state scale, but still sub nanometer. Um, and that we thought we could grow things in solution and make decent kind of crystals with relatively low defects. So we, our first results came out last year, and we, in that paper, we talked about our, our first two things that we tried were, were metal organic frameworks, MOPs, um, that have kind of small and big nearest neighbor spacings. So we thought maybe we'd want to check that out. And we did, in that paper, we showed some kind of initial characterization. So what did we actually grow? We grew big formate formate crystals. We grew tiny formate crystals. But we grew them. They look about right when you do x-ray diffraction. Um, we did photoluminescence. So shine a blue laser on and look at what comes out. Um, that's a real picture of a material, right? Super fun. It's actually how the student, when he, some of the crystals are really small, and if he drops one, and he's lost it. He actually just has a blue laser pointer, <laughs> and he does this until he finds it, <laughs> um, because it lights up so bright. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's fun. Um, uh, and so we look at what comes out, and we can see 
so the, the transition of interest for quantum memory is this one that doesn't always appear for symmetry reasons. So we want to we want to see it in our photoluminescence. We can do optical lifetime measurements and see that we have this kind of standard, you know, one and a half ish millisecond long lifetime at cryogenic temperatures, which is, you know, we haven't measured the actual homogeneous line width or the individual atom line widths, but this is suggestive that it's going to be reasonable. What's the transition that the blue line is exciting? Actually, who knows? Okay. Some high there's, line there's so many levels, okay. right? I haven't drawn all the levels in between either. Um, there's levels everywhere, and there's inhomogeneous broadening, and there's, mm -hmm. yeah, so. Um, but blue works better than green for these crystals, mm -hmm. as it turns out, yeah. So it does enough. And then we get, it's basically phonon relaxation down to this level, and then optical. Right. And then you see all the radiated stuff. Yeah. Um, so this was all well and good, but this isn't what we care about. What we care about is narrowing up that inhomogeneous broadening. So what we actually have to do is photoluminescence excitation. And, and sorry, the yeah. lifetime for this, these are milliseconds, okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what we actually need to do to measure that, the thing we care about is photoluminescence excitation. So here we have a narrow band tunable laser. We tune it across the transition of interest, and we just look at how much light comes out, right, as a function of the excitation frequency. Um, so we, we use this to kind of down select. So in work that will be published relatively soon or will be written up soon, we've, we've found kind of three decent candidates to start with. So one is one of those first ones that we grew that, that metal organic framework, European format formamide, where we can see this kind of 10 gigahertz um, inhomogeneous line width when we do our photoluminescence excitation. That's bigger than a standard doped crystal, like a European doped YSO crystal, but with a thousand times the Europium density. And in the doped crystals, your inhomogeneous line width goes with, with density, because that's the primary defect. So our spectral density here is a lot higher than what our spectral density is in our typical doped materials. Um, we tried to grow this. We succeeded. We made these little tiny needles. Um, we succeeded in growing this, um, and it actually has an even smaller um, inhomogeneous line width, which is nice. But when we grew this, we also accidentally grew this, um, and it was actually nicer and bigger <laughs> than the crystals. Um, and it also has a, a, a reasonably nice um, in the um, So, so this is where we are now. We're kind of looking at these three things, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to understand why some of our samples are better than others. Um, we've got a long list of things to do now that we have this photoluminescence excitation working. Everything else, right? So our long list of things. So spectral hole burning. So this is this is hot off the presses. We burned a spectral hole in that uh, one of those crystals. So come in with a laser. It should optically pump atoms into other spin states, and thus we should get fewer atoms at the place where the laser was. If you come back in with another laser and scan it across, and that's what we're seeing here, um, that we can burn a spectral hole. Uh, also, we want to actually do coherent measurements to measure that optical coherence time and see what it is. How radiative is it? The lifetime's a millisecond and a half. What's the coherence time? How close is it? To that, to that lifetime. Um, really, uh, we're also seeing, because in that one crystal we accidentally grew, the spacing was really close. And we think we're seeing interactions. So depending in certain regimes, we're seeing this kind of multi-peak structure, which we think is, is interactions between the nearest neighbor European mount. We want to try and figure out what that is. Um, and then something that if anyone here is a material scientist, um, we're trying to figure out ways to study the, directly study the role of defects, the materials properties, and the optical properties that we care about. But the defect rate that we have in our crystals is pretty low. We do actually diffraction, it looks fine. Um, and so trying to do very, very careful measurements of relatively low defect rates, something we're interested in. Um, so we're looking for methods to do that. We have some ideas. Um, once the advanced photon source at Argon is back up and running, we have more ideas. Uh, so, so that's something we really want to do to refine our growth. Um, and, and reduce these inhomogeneous line widths. Um, and then also physics, right? Physics would be nice for physicists. Um, so like I said, our spectral density here is really, really high, right? Our physical density of, of, of europium atoms in these crystals is approaching 10 to the 22%. Right? That is definitely higher than anybody else has in terms of physical density of atoms or atom like atoms, right? We still have inhomogeneous broadening, so the spectral density isn't quite that high, right? It's not really 10 to the ninth atoms per lambda cube because you only care about atoms that are identical 
width in there. We don't exactly know how many frequency classes we have because we don't exactly know our homogeneous line width and things like that. But as long as this number is smaller than this number, um, we should be in this superradiant regime. So we, we are, we're, we're also interested in trying to see superradiance and, and thinking more along the lines of collective effects. I mean, those beats that you have might be a signature already of you know, some collective interactions. Mm, with I don't think they're collective. Okay. I don't think that that's what that is. Not sure, though. Okay. We're really not sure. It's weird that those peaks there, it's, it's polarization dependent. Huh. So at some polarizations, we see one peak, and at some we see two, and at some we see three, and it's the orientation of our crystal is also random, and so different crystals show different structures. And we're not really sure what's going on here, so we're trying to figure that out. All right. Great. I will go very briefly over the second half of the talk um, so that we can still have some questions at the end. So better photonic integration. So this started out as a collaboration with EOX at Maryland. Um, so thin film, getting a thin film material allows for photonic integration in a way that a bulk material does not. Basically because what do you, photonic integration, you need to make a waveguide, right? If you have a, a thin film of a material, you at least can, the confinement is kind of already given in that direction. You just got to change the material so that you can make like a ridge waveguide or, or something like that and get confinement in the transverse direction, right? Um, and if you have a thin film that's, you know, sub micron, sub, sub wavelength, basically, you can get kind of the, the tightest confinement that you can possibly get, right? And thin film lithium nivate uh, has been kind of commercially available for less than a decade, I think now, or maybe a order a decade now. Uh, and uh, so it's become really popular, and it's known that lithium nivate is a good host for rare atoms. Uh, and so with Edo, we first started making these thulium doped devices a few years ago, and then in my group recently, we've moved on to making erbium doped um, devices. So the way that you get this thin fill, the way that we get our thin film lithium nivate in the smart cut process, so we have bulk thulium doped lithium nivate. They sent helium atoms at it to make a damage layer, and they peel off a layer of lithium nivate and then put it on some substrate. Um, and we wanted to make sure that that plus our nanofabrication techniques um, didn't kill the properties of the thulium. So we did some kind of initial measurement of these properties. We looked at the photoluminescence, the lifetime of it, and it looked fine. We burned spectral holes, and we saw that both the kind of lifetime of the spectral hole and the line width of the spectral hole were reasonable and were similar to what one would see in bulk lithium, bulk thulium doped lithium nivate. Um, and we measured the optical coherence time. So we did a photon echo measurement um, and looked at the decay of that echo. Um, and that also looked, that matched basically what you expect in bulk lithium nivate. So once we can do that, we did do an atomic frequency comb um, memory, not for single photons, because our efficiency was very bad. Um, in our waveguide devices in our thulium doped lithium nivate. So the idea here is we have this inhomogeneously broadened set of thulium atoms. We come in with a train of optical pulses. A train of optical pulses is a frequency column in frequency space that does spectral hole burning. So everywhere where there's light, it burns away. It, it, it puts the atoms into some other state. Um, and so we make a spectral absorption, absorption profile that looks like a comb, right? Now, if you send in a pulse whose bandwidth is much larger than these comb teeth, you excite the atoms, you get dephasing of the different teeth relative to each other because of their detuning, but at time equal to one over delta, one over the spacing between the teeth, they automatically rephase and come back out. So this is why you get to set the memory time in advance by controlling what this, this dephasing is. Right. So, uh, we made a comb. And how fine can those teeth be? Like, what's right. that limited by? Which is a really good question. It's a practical limitation, right? Um, so the, the... I guess it depends on the pulse strain you're inputting. Right. And uh, how that translates. And, and how stable frequencies are and how stable your laser is and what's the homogeneous line with of the atoms. But also, the finer you make those teeth, the fewer atoms there are. Right. Right. And yeah. so then you have the problem that your optical depth is very good. Okay. Because you don't have a lot of atoms, so the absorption is bad. So there's trade offs there, too. Uh -huh. Okay. So yeah. then that would translate to a broad comb teeth eventually. Uh, if, if you have a smaller optical depth or not. A, a smaller optical depth means worse efficiency storage. 
right? If you have fewer atoms, you're less likely to actually manage to absorb the photon. Right. Yeah. 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 So 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 those trade-offs. So we made a comb. So the finesse of the comb, which is the the ratio of the width to the spacing or the spacing to the width. Um, this is a comb of finesse, like I think not quite two, uh, which is okay. Um, this is not real, so that has to do, that's an artifact of how we do our measurement. Um, but so we can make a comb with some spacing, right? And then we can do our protocol, and then we can vary the spacing of the comb and, and look at the echo that comes out. Um, and so we can see, we can build a comb to store for 90 nanoseconds, 130, 200, 250 nanoseconds. Watch this come out. Um, it turns out we couldn't really go past that, even though our coherence time is longer than that, because making a comb with smaller spacings um, practically in our experiment became very, very hard. And so you can, in fact, we have a super exponential decay uh, mm -hmm. of our very bad storage efficiency, um, which is due to the fact that our comb got worse and worse uh, as we tried to store for longer and longer times, which is another practical challenge um, in the top frequency comb memories. But there are, there are other systems that should be better. This was kind of, thulium isn't great. We had waveguides here, not cavities or anything, which isn't great. Uh, so there were a lot of reasons that this first attempt didn't work. And um, what's the Q factor like uh, for the? It was a waveguide, not a resonator. There is no Q. Oh, okay. There's. A, I yeah. thought there was a. Now ring we structure. Boom. Now we got a ring. So now. Oh, okay. Now we're making rings. Yeah. Okay. With Q factors approaching a million. Okay. Yeah. Um. So now we're making rings. So we switched over to erbium because uh, it should, there are a lot of benefits of erbium over thulium, um, longer optical coherence time, telecom operation. Um, and we're making rings, cavities, which helps with everything. Um, so it helps with increasing, if we get, we, we have a little parcel enhancement, helps with full burning, helps with opti effective optical depth. Um, right. So, so, and this is also going on in my lab. The other work was at Maryland. Um, with with Edo. So so in my lab we managed to make some rings and we can get Qs up to a million. I don't have the picture here, but we've also made some photonic crystal cavities with Qs of I think 30,000 is the best we have seen our photonic crystals. Um, so so these resonators should really should really help a lot. Um, and we've seen so we can do photoluminescence excitation here. So now we're sending in light and we're looking at the emission that comes out. This wide thing here is the erbium peak. So this is everywhere where there's erbium. There's also erbium in the bus waveguide, right? And so we're going to get emission, mm -hmm. whether or not we're on a resonance. These peaks, though, are the cavity resonances. So we get even more erbium emission when we get the cavity resonance. And if we measure the lifetime of that emission on a resonance and off a resonance, we see about a factor of three and a half in terms of that lifetime speed up. So what that should be, what that is, is a Purcell enhancement, right? And so the coupling of the atom to the resonator structure um, is faster than the coupling of the atom to free space. And so it emits faster into the resonator than it emits just into the waveguide. Um, and so we think that by, I think this uh, resonator actually was only like one by 10 to the five. Um, and we also think maybe we can start to make slightly smaller resonators, and that Purcell enhancement should go like the quality factor divided by the gap flow volume. So we think we can up that Purcell factor a little bit. Our cryostat never starts working again. Um, and uh, so, so this is this is this is exciting that we we've been able to see this. Um, so what we're working on now is we need to actually characterize the coherence properties of the erbium in our system. Um, we need to actually implement hole burning, um, paranatomic frequency comb in this system. Um, and eventually, we want to probably move to even smaller cavities, to kind of crystal cavities, uh, to to reduce that mode volume. How dense are the erbium emitters in this case? For collective, like I know, I'm trying to remember what the so so the the doping concentration in here. I want to say it's 0.1 percent. Um, so weirdly, the erbium is actually a substitutional dopant for lithium. I say okay. weirdly because if anyone who's ever looked at a periodic table, erbium and lithium are not the same size. <laughs> um, but it, it's a substitutional dopant for, for lithium. And so, in fact, because they're not the same size, the inhomogeneous broadening is enormous, right. nanometers yeah. wide, right? I was showing you in those europium crystals, inhomogeneous broadening of some gigahertz. 
that's in homogeneous broadening of, I don't know, is that a terahertz? Something huge, right? Um, and that's because there, the, you know, yeah, we've, we've got more defects because the doping is high, but also the defect is huge, right? Because you've just really strained that lattice by shoving an erbium in a lithium site. Um, and so the spectral density isn't that high, right? But also here, we're, we're, we're on chip, we're really interested in these protocols where we're gonna store on the optical transition, right? And not use a spin transition, relatively short lived storage, but on chip. Um, and so in that case, we're gonna take advantage of that bandwidth, right? And so even though our spectral density is low, we can get a lot of atoms as long as we go big broadband. All right, so I think I actually managed it. Um, so uh, atoms and solids are great for quantum optics um, because they're 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 good for actually coupling the light in and out of the system. And rare earth atoms have a lot of of benefits. And in my group, a lot of what we do is play around with the fact that we have this this flexibility in host material, um, trying to kind of optimize our systems for various different applications. Um, by playing around with what what host material we want, and we can make nice pictures because we get a physical addition. So here's the team and the funders that did it. Um, most of the work that I presented here, these guys conveniently stood together in the picture, um, was done by these guys, and the you know of course required. Let me know if you're looking for a postdoc. Thanks. Right. Uh, thank you. Questions? I have two small questions. First, uh, first slide about your first work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you try different materials for the positive uh, 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 else. So, what's the, uh, I mean, why you choose that materials? Or right. If another yeah. So it's a good question. So um, the the list of requirements in choosing. So we started off basically by looking through the literature of papers that have a synthesis method for a europium material where the nearest neighbor europium spacing is at least five angstroms, right? And that we thought we could do the synthesis method. That got us those two metal organic frameworks to start and a couple of other things, um, including some other oxides that we made, but then we didn't like. So they didn't make it on my slide. There's that's a relatively short list though, right? So then we started to think about things like, oh, okay, is there a material, a synthesis method in the literature for making it, but instead of europium, it's got a different rare earth in it. And then we think it should work if we just swap the rare earths because they're very similar. Or maybe, okay, we did some DFT as well to identify, do we think this compound would be stable, right? And so for that, it was, you know, things that are likely to have a big nearest neighbor spacing given the crystal structure. And also we want the other things in there preferably um, to be monoisotope, only have one isotope, one naturally occurring isotope, because that also helps with the inhomogeneous broadening. Because having multiple isotopes, um, that's, a, that's a source of defects as well, the, the, the wrong isotope. Um, and so we, we fed a bunch of things into a system and just started growing things. Um, and so we also tried a lot of other things that for one reason or another didn't work. We also wanted growth methods that we thought would be relatively low defect. Um, so this is all grown in solution. So either near room temperature or at elevated temperatures in a hydrothermal scheme. Yeah. So we are working with a, with a proper real material science group um, as well. We're not just a bunch of physicists wandering around in the dark, which helps. What about the urban? I don't remember before there, you can go up to urban in two materials, uh, MOS2. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe one as least least a single one. Right? I have not seen any work looking at the optical properties of erbium in like a, a TMD or, or something, some other 2MD, 2D material at cryogenic temperatures. But boy, would I love to do that, so <laughs> right? It's much easier to separate the two athletes as single ones. But the, yeah, so I don't know what would happen, right? And just a, 
I don't know. There are people who are looking at kind of molecular crystals. So you make some molecule with some rare earth atom, and then you make a crystal out of those molecules. That's a very interesting way to go. It's closely related to this course, right? Um, but yeah, I would love to to put. So the main reason reason we should be crystal materials is to realize the low homogeneous one wire spectrum. In this case, it's to look at yeah to find to get low homogeneous so, line with a so high spectral density. So it's you need to reduce the local stream, right? That's the main. The local strain differ deviations. So the local strain inhomogeneity, right? The strain, you actually need local strain that allows the transition effectively, right? You, you need an electric field to make the transition allowed, but you want this same electric field at every. Yeah. <laughs> so how uh, many the dogs there? Uh, real M is by M in partition or just the Yeah, so that's a good question. So so the a lot of the materials, the kind of traditional rare earth materials, are laser materials. So, neodymium I mean, yeah, There's one of those in here, right? Neodymium I mean, yeah, crystal. Um, those, the rare earth is incorporated during growth, and that's that like Tchaikovsky growth. They grow up in the wool of yeah. Um, our lithium niobate, similarly, the erbium is incorporated during growth, and then it gets smart cut and turned into a thin film. Here, we're obviously growing in solution. We're incorporated in the, the European. Um, you can also do ion implantation into an existing material. You tend to end up with worse properties if you do that instead of incorporating during growth because you kind of add more defects, right? But it's not crazy. Um, so people do both. Uh, yeah. Well, the second, also the second word, mm -hmm. uh, the, the second word is uh, the host material is the laser element. Yeah. Oh, I just want to say it. Because the Christian, uh, the New York City, Jeff Thomas, mm -hmm. they use their silicon. Ah, uh, but he is, so the, the the erbium doesn't live in silicon in Jeff's work. The erbium lives in uh, yttriumorphous silicon, and then he puts the silicon on top and couples uh, by the evanescent field, right? right? So he's trying to kind of get get the advantages of both because erbium and silicon. Very recently, people have managed to see nice properties of erbium and silicon, but people have there have been decades of people attempting to get nice properties of erbium and silicon and phalen. So Jeff is, you know, cleverly making the best photonic structures he can make in silicon and then using the best host material he has in yttriumorthosilicate and then just get using the evanescent coupling between the two, right? Having the atoms inside the material has some benefits. The fun, there's a, a higher fundamental limit to the coupling because you live in the material, you're not relying on an evanescent field. Um, also, lithium niobate has a lot of benefits actually over silicon for quantum things. You can build sources and modulators and, and other stuff. Yeah. Quite a more high level question because mm -hmm. we're also talking about having delays on chips. Mm -hmm. What kind of applications would you imagine? Would it be like photonic quantum computing or also networks? Or... I, I mean, I can I can imagine a lot of them. I think we're pretty far away, so I'm not gonna gonna nail down the applications now. But let's say that uh, I can get a decent enough delay on chip that I can put, if it's in lithium niobate, for instance, I can also make a photon pair source on the same chip. I can delay one of the photons of my photon pair source, and I can that lets me do some you know, multiplexing things to either turn a probabilistic photon pair, a probabilistic photon source into a deterministic photon source, or some kind of other you know, uh, fusion-based stuff or whatever, right? If I can get on chip delays, all of a sudden I can do logic um, while my photons are are stored and 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 detect some a photon over here and do something with one over here. So are there like additional challenges with putting it on? I guess there are many additional challenges putting it on a chip for that. Well, so for for uh, the big but the big benefit of going on chip is as long as everything's on the chip, you don't get losses at the interfaces, right? And you can make everything kind of happen fast, and you can make the whole thing low loss as long as it's small enough, right? Whereas trying to do all of this in free space is much harder. But you know, you can make a photon pair source on chip, you can put your detector on chip, you can put some modulators on chip, put some beam splitters on chip. You can, if you can put everything on chip, there's a lot of benefits to that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, just go through the atomic frequency comb protocol again? Oh, yeah. Does the single photon need to be in the frequency comb or is that just a drive? So, First, you prepare the comb with classical light, right? 
And this is some pulse train of classical light that does the hole burning. This comb here is the absorption profile of your atoms following your preparation, Okay. right? Now the photon or the pulse that you're gonna store, its bandwidth has to cover many comb teeth. Right. Okay. So right. you don't need to prepare the pulse in that configuration, as in you don't need to do any more digital stuff. No, the pulse is just a Gaussian pulse. Do you expect the efficiency to change shot to shot depending on where the pulse is originated from? Let's say, is it a pulse? Because with Gaussians, things can be made nice artificially mm -hmm. in paper, but you would have some effect of your filtering or your pumping. If let's say your let's say your photons are coming from a down conversion process, mm -hmm. they'll have a different characteristic overall than a photon from a single emitter. So yeah, okay, this is a good question. Does the efficiency of an AFC protocol depend on the shape of the photon, whether it's like a decaying exponential versus a Gaussian versus a Lorentzian? Um, it's a very good question. There have been, there are papers in the literature doing kind of detailed calculations of the efficiency of atomic frequency comb protocols. My guess is it doesn't matter much. Um, there are some fundamental limits to the efficiency. If all you do is this, you actually can't store more than 50-ish percent of fish. In practice, you can't that's more than a few percent. Like the overlap between your frequency. Uh, no, that's actually because of the reabsorption. There's like a, there's like an optimal optical depth that you hit where if it gets worse. But if you put the whole thing in even a really bad cavity, that 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 limit goes away. Um, so so yeah, there's a, there has been a fair amount of work done on the kind of theoretical side of this. But again, all real atomic frequency combs are bad. Because there's so many practical limitations today. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. One question. Is this a slide for the next figure? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, this is like you determine your the delta, uh, determine the two leaves. Well, so we choose the delta by controlling the, the pulse train that creates the cone. So the, the, the delta is, in fact, the inverse of the spacing in time between the pulses and our pulse train. I mean, this figure, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, peaks, but is there, the internal two peaks looks like it's not totally equal. Well, that's because our comb isn't very good, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't, we, you know, we, we, for a variety of reasons, our comb was not very good. Right, and so that's why it looks kind of nasty, because the basically our our optical lifetime was not a lot faster than our like long lived state. You're, you're shelving atoms to make the comb, but it's like filling a bucket with a hole in it. If if the rate at which you're filling the bucket is too slow, which is like your your optical pumping rate is too slow, and the bucket is too big, which is like the lifetime of your metal stable state is too short. You're not going to do a very good job filling the bucket. All right. Uh, let's thank Elizabeth again. <laughs>